Good evening and welcome. My name is Dr. Christine Schinken. I am the president of Our Lady of Wisdom College. And it's my pleasure to welcome you here tonight. I welcome especially any guests who come from a distance and all of those who have come before. Good evening. And to you are Summer Institute of Prince, Dr. Christine Schinken. This year, the president of the Council of Wisdom, our college, college. And it's my pleasure for this year's Thank you, our conference is No Lifestyle. I want to special yes, perspectives from this distance in person. And to all of those. So we're very blessed today to have as our speaker, and to our keynote address, to be part of our programs of the new minutes. This year, the president of the Council of Wisdom, our college. So Charlie doesn't need much of an introduction. This is my pleasure for this year's.
something, especially something you love. It's a beautiful thing. And then again, so many levels of uh, like how someone is looking and so many other things, fishing, carpentry, and all that type of thing. And this, this conference is about self knowledge know thyself. And we always speak about when you need to know who you are. Blacksmith, 
Latin classes, even at a theater, and other things. Like, isn't that cool? Like, he had all these beautiful things going on wherever he could, you know, find place and helpers. He was teaching these boys with tremendous love. And the boys felt loved by him. Beautiful thing. Now, what's interesting about St. John Bosco, you've all heard about his dreams. He had all these prophetic dreams. And, and it says here, during his whole life, John Bosco was to, was to be inspired and guided by strangely vivid dreams. God's revelation of what his work in the world was to be. The first took place about this time when he was nine years old. He seemed to be in a large yard near the cottage where a great many boys were playing together. Some were laughing, some playing games, and some fighting, some swearing and using foul language. John shouted to them to stop, and dashing in began to strike at them. And then he saw to, to say how the Lord Jesus appeared to him. And the Lord said, not with blows, but with gentleness and charity. You must take care of them and win their hearts. He said, teach them the beauty of virtue and the ugliness of sin. And then the Lord Jesus introduced him to his mother who appeared to him as a beautiful shepherdess and she helped him to, to care, to, to learn the wisdom of caring for these boys. And um, St. John Bosco's like his whole life from the age of nine, his whole life he had this deep, divinely inspired understanding that it's by loving and kindness and patience and goodness that he could win the hearts of these, these rough boys, you know, and, and he had uh, other similar dreams where the Lord further impressed on him, again, this calling to, to just have a burning love and charity and a kindness and a gentleness with the boys. Um, and, and again, he, it's, it's kind of, you could almost say a defining teaching of St. John Bosco's for the whole church. I mean, it's not like we didn't understand this before. There were many other great saints who were tremendously gen, uh, gentle and kind. But again, it's, it's easy as educators to kind of get into a strict harshness and think that, well, that's what God wants, you know? And not according to St. John Bosco. Again, I'm sure St. John Bosco, the odd time, had to tell the boys, hey guys, smart up, you know, and then whatever, you know? But the point is, is I think St. John Bosco's, you'd say, revelation of this call to kindness, you know, is, is, a, is, is a teaching for the whole church. And I, I put St. John Bosco as one of the eagles in the church, the eagles named John. You know, St. John the Evangelist, the beloved disciple, he's depicted with an eagle because his gospel has the kind of the stunning insight into the mystery of Christ and his Christology. Um, so John, the beloved disciple, he's the eagle. And then St. John the Baptist, another John, our Lord Jesus himself said he was a bright and shining lamp and no one born of woman is as great as him. He was a little intense, you know, so shows there's a diversity. And then there's, um, I wrote down a list of where is it now? Uh, oh, whose feast is it today? St. John Vianney. Again, you want to talk about setting the bar for priesthood and being a pastor. Again, one of the great eagles, St. John Vianney. And then St. John of the Cross. They call him the Prince of of mystics. Again, when you read the writings of St. John the Cross, he, he takes us to dizzying heights in terms of breaking open the mystery of, of this mystical union with God. And, and like I said, I, I put St. John Bosco, kind of one of these great John. And also St. John Paul II, again, his theology of the body, talk about prophetic, talk about piercing the mystery of the gift of human sexuality at a time that it was so needed, you know, perfect. We need it now even more so. I know you all agree. And so again, St. John Bosco, he showed the way in terms of teaching, educating these young boys. Now, 
There's so many cool St. John Bosco stories, if you're familiar with his life. His life was full of miracles. He was just a wonderful spiritual man of God. And beautiful uh, things like, yeah, uh, he, he, um, he housed, he had a, uh, kind of a you know, place for housing a lot of the boys he was educating. He had to feed them. Sometimes there was no food. And at least one time I mentioned in the book, maybe more than once, he said, okay, how much do you have? And next, I think in one case, 12 loaves. Okay, pray, start distributing it to whatever, two or 300 boys. And they started distributing these little 12 loaves and fed everyone. And guess how many loaves were left over? 12. You know? And there was a boy who was visiting who was kind of interested in John uh, Bosco's work, but he wasn't too impressed, so he was going to leave. He saw the miracle. He stayed there. I think, he, you know, he became a member of the Salesian community. Um, multiplication of food. Also, you get the stories of, I mean, he got these enterprises going. They said if he had a dollar, he'd spend two. <laughs> you know? he, just spent, he didn't care about it. He just spent money. And if he felt called to something, he'd just do it. And, um, but he had these bills sometimes to pay, and they were you know, kind of getting ready to sue him after him. And his stories were, you know, the person would come, and it's like the last, you know, chance. And it was one story, there was a little bit, people waiting to meet him, and someone barges in, and says, I need to see you. And St. John Boston was like, I'm, I'm, I'm busy. He said, I need to see you. He said, well, what is it? This is for you. Boom. And he walks out. And then the next guy in line to meet him was the guy coming for the money. Guess how much money that guy just gave the exact amount. That was, you know, <laughs> Cool stories like that, which, which again, are common. When you do the work of God, He backs you up with signs and wonders and miracles. What did, what did Mother Angelica say? If you want to see the miraculous, you've got to be willing to do the ridiculous. St. <laughs> John Bosco is an example of that. Another cool story from St. John Bosco. Uh, yeah, these are kind of amusing, just to show you what kind of man he was. It says, he had... He had a lot of enemies because he was living at a time when, when the, the, the Italian government was, was quite anti-church and so they suspected what he was doing was kind of, you know, in rebellion to the church. And so he had his enemies. And also I think some of the boys could be used to, to do shady work, but St. John Bosco was reforming them. So he was taking away, you know, troublemakers. So one night as he was giving the usual catechism lesson to his boys, he was shot at through the window. The bullet passing between his body and his arm. The boys were terrified. Come, said he, go on with your lesson. That was a bad shot. The worst of it is that my best soutane has been torn. So apparently it went through his, through his, his cassock or whatever. And he thought that was kind of amusing. You know, he was a little upset. He also thought it was amusing. Another, just one last, oh, I love this story from the life of uh, St. John Bosco. Again, he, he had his enemies. They, they, they tried to attack him a number of times or set him up, inviting him to, to you know, late night sick calls, but really they were trying to you know, take him out. And, and it says here, among all the strange episodes in the life of Don Bosco, one of the strangest was the appearance, appearance of a dog, Grigio. A huge greyhound that appeared suddenly at a moment of danger, reappeared on many occasions, and disappeared some years later when the danger was over. He asked for neither food nor shelter, was savage as a wolf against an enemy, but gentle as a lamb with the boys of the oratory, who gave him the name Grigio, the grey one. And so this dog would just show up, and oftentimes, um, like the first time it showed up, John Boss, who was doing another one of his late night visits, he lived in a rough part of town, and all of a sudden this big dog just comes up next to him, and he's kind of at first like a little nervous, but the dog didn't seem to want to bother him, so the dog walked with him the whole way. And then he found out later that some guys were planning on, you know, attacking him, and a number of times, John, St. John Bosco was attacked and all of a sudden Grigio shows up and just savagely, you know, goes after, went, went after them. And then there's another uh, amusing story related to Grigio. It says, one night, instead of accompanying Don Bosco, Grigio went to the oratory and refused to let him go out. 
lying down across the door of his room. For once, growling and showing ill temper when Don Bosco made the slightest attempt to, to leave. And then uh, St. John Bosco's mother lived with him and helped him in his work. And his mother said, it says, don't go out, John, said his mother. If you won't listen to me, at least listen to that dog. He has more sense than you have. <laughs> you know, St. John, John Bosco would go out even in um, you know, scary situations. All right. So, what I want to again highlight with St. John Bosco, he definitely knew his identity, he knew his dignity, but boy, did he know his authority. He knew his calling from God. He knew that God had called him for a mission. And when God, what God uh, appoints, he anoints. What God orders, he delivers. And, and St. John Bosco knew that his mission was to help these disadvantaged boys. And he didn't let anything stop him. Very impressive. And again, from, from a young age, from the, from the age of nine, and it's interesting, towards the end of his life, at the age of 69, uh, at, at, at a great event when he was, saw just all the, the members of the Salesian Order, many of them now going off to, to far off countries on mission to do the same work he was doing in, in Turin. He said, I had all the time before my eyes that first dream that was the key to my whole life. Those boys like wild beasts, that heavenly shepherdess who transformed them into lambs, her injunction to, to, to me, by kindness and gentleness, you must win them. And one word above all was ringing in my ears, her answer when I begged her to give me the key to what I saw. One day in God's time, you will understand. That was 60 years ago, and I understand today. You see, 60 years later, he says, yeah, you see that dream at the age of nine, that wasn't my, just my imagination. It was a calling from God. And again, he saw the confirmation, the great number of people who followed him in his, in his work of helping, um, helping the, the poor. Uh, and, 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 and again, we, I want you, again, as we begin this, this weekend, and contemplate our, 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 our identity, our dignity, our, our, our authority, our destiny. I want you to think about what's inside of you. You know, what, what has the Lord called you to? What burns in your heart? What were you made for? And just think of people like St. Francis of Assisi. He was on a mission from God. Nothing could stop him. St. Francis Xavier again. He was a fire. Nothing could stop him. We know St. Mother Teresa. She had authority. She was unstoppable. She had a God-given mission. And she knew it. St. Anthony of the desert. You know, living as far as the desert father movement and so on and again I want you to, to just ask yourself what's inside of me what was I made for and to have that fiat of our blessed mother to already now say yes Lord whatever it is you're calling me to whatever it is I was made for from my youth I would say that perhaps all of us, even in our childhood, the goodness of God, we've been given little kind of premonitions of what the Lord has in store, has, has, plan, has planned for us. Now, I want to highlight some um, unique things or some, some kind of key things about the example of St. John Bosco and his mission and the authority given to him. So first of all, as I mentioned, he knew his calling. He knew what he was meant to do. Secondly, interesting, he knew where he was supposed to do it. He was given in a dream uh, the, the, the city of Turin. When he came to Turin and, and began to establish himself, he said, this is the place I'm called to. And, and also he had a dream to, and he saw a church that was to be built and he built that church again. Interesting, being called to a location Kind of like the Benedictines, you know the Benedictine monks, if I'm not mistaken, they take a fourth vow, the vow of stability. They park themselves in the place and nothing's going to make them leave, you know. And there's even powerful stories of monks, you know, they're threatened, they say, we're not leaving, and sometimes they get killed, you know, that's how, you know. Anyways, third thing is again, 
St. John Bosco, he knew, he knew his calling, he knew where he was supposed to do it, but also his approach. He was unwavering in this his whole life. He knew how he was supposed to minister to these boys. He was consistent because, again, it was, it was given to him by God. He was inspired. And then in the life of St. John Bosco, we have a singular focus. His whole priesthood was that one mission, even beginning as a boy, you know, to, to, to care for underprivileged, disadvantaged boys. And there's, there's something about a person who has a focused kind of mission. They, they, they focus on one thing and they do it well. It's a beautiful thing. And then again, from, from a, a young age, and part of the reason I mention this is I just invite you to imagine with me, like just imagine a person who, from a young age, they know what they're called to, and they know how to do it, and they, they know where to do it, and they're committed to doing it their whole life. <laughs> That's pretty powerful. When someone has that much focus in their calling and, and again I, I don't think every one of us is called to one specific place for their whole life doing the same thing but I wonder if uh, uh, more of us do, don't realize the need to, to kind of commit to what it is we're called to in a more focused a more committed way you know okay so um, we're talking again, we're talking about authority. Now this of course comes from scripture. In Matthew 28, the Great Commission, our Lord Jesus says, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. The Lord Jesus, the divine Son of God, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Our Lord Jesus Christ, he's the King of Kings, he's the Lord of Lords. One day at His name, every knee will bow. In our secular world, we treat Christianity just as one religion among many. It's not. Well, the Lord Jesus is Lord of Lords, King of Kings, King of all nations. He's the Lord of Canada. He's the Lord of Europe. He's the Lord of the whole world. He should be directing whatever, the United Nations, the World Health Organization, He is Lord, Lord of all. And He needs to be recognized as Lord of all, the one who came to save us, to redeem us, who walked on water, who raised the dead, who split time in two, who cast out demons, who came with a message of love that changed humanity. He is Lord of all. And the world needs to recognize Jesus Christ is Lord, He's King. We don't set Him aside. As Catholics, we proclaim the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords, and we want to see His kingdom come, His reign come in this world. And we're not going to stop preaching this. We don't believe in, in a, a secularized, atheistic, agnostic world. We believe in a world where Jesus Christ is recognized as Lord and Savior of all. <laughs> now what's my point? <laughs> all authority in, on heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations. So again, the Lord is saying, all authority is given to me and you, my disciples, whom I have prepared and trained and taught and anointed and breathed my spirit into you and fed you with my body and blood, you now take this anointing, this authority, and go to the ends of the world. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them. To observe all that I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you always to the close of the age. So you see, teaching, very important. We must teach this world. We must teach the next generation. It's vital. The Lord Jesus, too, his first ministry on the face of the earth was when he was in the temple at the age of 12. What was he doing? He was teaching like a good Jew. You know how Jews, uh, the Jewish you know, rabbis, they like to teach? 
by asking questions. Oh, the Lord Jesus, he was teaching the, the elders in the temple already at the age of 12 were called to teach. Now, some of us have a charism of teaching, a specific calling to teach. But again, every one of us, you know, at some level, we're called to this great commission to teach. And, um, you know, part of the calling in our life, whatever it is, each one of us, it's unique. As a matter of fact, if your calling doesn't seem a little weird, it's probably not a calling from God because God is so creative. He's so unique, you know? And, and, and so, again, your particular calling in this life, um, the Lord want, wants you, wants you to, to, to recognize it and he, he wants you to, be, to kind of flow out of the power given to you. Now, when you do this, when you discover what you were made for, there's an energy that comes with us. And this, this is a basic teaching on, on, on charisms, you know, of discovering how the Holy Spirit has anointed you in a particular way. One of the things we teach is, listen, you know, if there's something you can do energetically, almost like the Energizer battery, you just keep going and going and going and going, and nothing, wear, nothing wears you out when you're doing that. That's a sign of a charism. And especially if you can do it with joy. You know, when, when you discover your calling and your charism, there's a, again, you're, you're unstoppable. There's, there's a joy, there's a power. And Scripture talks about this. I think it's Isaiah 40. The Lord says, Though young men faint and grow weary, and youth stagger and fall, they who hope in the Lord will renew their strength. They will soar as on eagles' wings. They will run and not grow weary. They will walk and not grow faint. And that's a kind of a characteristic of the saints, you know, they have this, this divine drive to keep going with their mission and a joy that goes with it. Now, it doesn't mean you're not going to get tired out sometimes. As a matter of fact, St. John Bosco, when he began his work with the boys, 20 months, not even two years into it, he had a complete burnout. He thought he was going to die, you know. And one of the things, they don't say this in the book, it's my speculation, but when he was ordained, he made a decision to only sleep five hours a night. And like, I don't know, you know, like maybe he could have got a little more sleep, you know, because it's not. So the point is, we have to respect our humanity. Um, but when we're doing God's work, there is a supernatural power and a joy and an anointing that goes with it. Now, again, there's just so many examples of this. I'll give you one example. Um, in my last church, we had a, a, a lady, a, a, a wife and mother, and she would teach the, the NFP to the couples who were preparing for marriage. So she would teach natural family planning to couples preparing for marriage. And it was one of the requirements. It was part of the um, marriage prep course. So you had to sit down with Michelle. And she had a bit of a either science or nursing background, and she was you know, good devout Catholic, big family, very, very, very intelligent, a good teacher. Uh, but she would meet with these couples. And I remember one evening, there was, wasn't many people in the church, and it was another evening where she spent, you know, whatever it was, an hour or two with a couple. And I remember at the end of the evening, as I was wrapping up, I thought, you know what? I'm going to go say a word of encouragement to her because here she is, and she lived a bit of a distance away. But here she is driving a long distance, you know, spending all this time at the church, meeting with couples, like, maybe she's getting discouraged, so I'm going to go say a word of encouragement, so I just drop in and say, hey, you know, I think, thank you very much for what you're doing, it's really great, how's it going? And she's like, radiant, she says, oh, I love doing this. <laughs> she says, you know, I, I meet these couples, and many of them, they're kind of, you know, a little resistant, a little skeptical about what I'm going to teach them about, the, the, you know, the Catholic Church's teaching on uh, marriage and sexuality. And she says, you know, when I present to them the church's teaching on marriage and sexuality, first of all, most of them, they don't have a clue what the church's teaching is. But she says, when I teach them, it blows them away. Most of them, it just rocks their world. In an hour and two, so many of them, you can tell that after this little meeting, this little teaching with her, their marriage will be categorically different. 
And in particular, the whole thing of, you know, not living for yourself, but making a gift of yourself, and, you know, the, the, the self-sacrifice and the joy, the, the fruitfulness, all of that. And she gets in, you know, it's, it's NFP, so she gets into the nitty-gritty with them. But it's, it's kind of like the splendor of truth. You know, truth is kind of self-evident. And she says she knows, she can tell a lot of them, and just admit that that conversation, that teaching, it changes their approach to marriage and also having children. She knows <laughs> there's more little children in the world because of her teaching. She knows that for a fact, the openness to life and the, you know, the, the fruitfulness and the gift of life and all that, she's able to communicate that in a way that these couples are going to approach their married life differently, their family life differently. So she's telling me this and you can tell she's energized. You can tell she loves what she does. It's almost like she doesn't really need that much encouragement because what she sees when she does her ministry is so beautiful, you know? I mean, it's always good to encourage people, obviously. But again, uh, when we are operating in our charism, when we're doing what we were you know, made to do, called to do, when we're faithful to that, Again, there's a joy, there's a, a, a delight. Now, it doesn't mean we don't have struggles. We all have struggles here. Is there anyone here who doesn't have struggles? Look at nobody. We all have struggles. So I'm not, you know, no one's saying there's not going to be struggles. Scripture says we must pass through many trials to enter the kingdom of God. Um, but again, it's categorically different. When we've opened our heart to the Lord, we've told our Lord, whatever it is, you want me to do, I'll do it. Speak, Lord, your servant is listening. And we, and we discover that calling and we when we go after it. Now, every one of us, we need to uh, discover our calling. Every one of us has a star that we need to follow, like the three magi. I love that story. You know, they're, they're looking to the heavens, following a star. Isn't that a cool image? Every one of us, we have a dream we need to pursue, a mountain we need to climb, a battle we need to fight, a mission we need to accomplish. And tonight, as we begin this conference in a particular way, you know, I want to call those of you who, who feel that call to teaching in a particular way. There are so many forces today that are teaching ideologies and, and, and even spirituality and, 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 and a culture that is so anti-gospel, anti-life. I mean, did you know, have you noticed our world has gone completely bonkers? Like, am I the only one who kind of feels this way? Like, you know, we're living in a world, they like, don't get me going about what we're teaching our young people today in our schools, through Hollywood and our music, on social media. It's nuts. Absolutely bonkers. And again, our response, particularly those of you who have, who have a, a particular calling and charism to teaching, you must... You must commit to teaching with all your heart, with the fire and the love of God, you know, to, to, to bring the truth you know, of our identity, our dignity, our authority, our destiny to the people entrusted to us, whether it's, again, your scouting group, the boys and girls in your scouting group, or, or your yeah, whatever, hockey team, or your classroom, or your, your, your university children, or your, your youth group, or whatever. We're having all kinds of fun with our youth group in Ottawa, by the way. Some of you may have heard of it because there's people from, I think, Barry's Bay who, who come to our, our youth group. But it's, it's kind of funny because our youth group kind of exploded during all the lockdowns. You know, all those restrictions, everything was restricted. You couldn't do anything. Well, we felt called to keep the youth group going. As a matter of fact, our Archbishop said, make youth a priority. And somehow, we, like, we kept going and somehow the young people heard about that and it caused our youth group to continue to grow and grow. And uh, uh, anyways, what's my point? My point is, is again, those of you called to, to, to teaching, uh, you need to, to, to recommit, especially this weekend. And the last point I wanna make before we're gonna pray, we're gonna pray for the fire of the Holy Spirit to descend upon us and give us His holy fire, give us His anointing, renew His authority in us to teach. Before we do that, there's a saying, they say that saints come in clusters. Have you heard that before? It's very rare to have kind of one saint 
and they live and around him or her, like there's no other saints. They say saints typically come in clusters. And I just love that, that reality. And one of my dreams, you know, is to be kind of part of a cluster of saints, you know? Not necessarily a canonized saint. I couldn't care less what the world thinks about me when I pass on, you know, as long as I make it to heaven somehow. Um, but again, life is short. Scripture says the span of our life is 70 years or 80 for those who are strong. Now, some people do make it into their 90s, praise God, but the point is we have a short window of life. So why not do something that will have eternal uh, blessings, you know, that, that will, will bear eternal fruit. It's wonderful to teach someone to snowboard and to surf, that's great, but it's better to teach someone about their dignity, their identity as a child of God. You know, to teach someone to connect with the, the God, the Father who created them, to fall in love with God, and to be filled with God, and to bring others to God. There's nothing that compares with that. You know, many of us, we've experienced many of the worldly, whatever, pleasures or, or you know, uh, uh, awards or whatever. We've experienced the world, but when we experience the things of the kingdom, it's categorically different. It's just like, it's what, it, it, it's what really matters. And so, again, to be, to be part at this time in history, rather than to, you know, just frustrated and angry with the darkness, to respond by doing something. And with others around us, you know, who are doing something, trying, you know, no one's perfect, okay, but, but we're trying to do something, to be part of the children of God who believe in Jesus, who love Jesus, who are trying to follow Jesus, and who are trying to bring light into this world of darkness. There's nothing more important than this. And again, in particular, teaching. Okay, so St. John of the Bosco, St. John Bosco, some of the saints that were part of his cluster, St. Dominic Savio, a young boy who joined his group, and they say, just a, a holy, holy boy, tremendously powerful with the other boys. He, he, he spent three years with John Bosco, and then he died. And I think it was, you know, partly because of helping during um, a contagion, uh, but died in the order of sanctity, a great, a great saint. Um, saint John Bosco's right-hand man, Michael, Father Michael Rua, he was beatified. Saint John Bosco was working with a saint right, right next to him. Uh, as a young priest, Saint John Bosco consulted another young priest that it says, a saintly young priest who had the gift of guiding souls. Saint John Bosco went to him a number of times for counsel, and this is Saint Joseph Cafasso, so a, a saint that helped Saint John Bosco, guided him. And then a, a young lady, saw what St. John Bosco was doing, wanted to do the same thing with, with disadvantaged girls. John Bosco, he wanted to see this happen too. She started the, the um, Daughters of Our Lady Help of Christians to do the same work John Bosco was doing, and now she's St. Maria uh, Mazzarella. And there's probably others. Isn't that beautiful? And again, this was a time of struggle for Catholics in Italy. And in the midst of this, Beautiful, wonderful saints, you know, leading people to eternal life. And so, brothers and sisters, I hope this weekend that you will catch and have the fire renewed to be a light shining in the darkness. So shall we pray? Yes. Who here wants to receive just a new outpouring of the Lord's grace? and His love, and His fire, and His wisdom. Maybe just hold your hands open just as a sign of your openness to God. Just, we're praying with the Blessed Mother, her yes, her fiat. Behold the handmaid of the Lord, let it be done to me according to your word. Speak, Lord, your servant is listening. Father in heaven, we love you, we praise you. Father, thank you for sending your Son, Jesus, who redeemed us, through His precious blood and of love for us. Father, thank You for revealing to us our identity, our dignity in Christ through the blood of Christ, the authority You've given to us, and our destiny. 
Father, I ask you in a particular way now to anoint your children, especially every uh, one involved in teaching. Lord, pour out a new grace of teaching, a charism of teaching, authority to teach in your name, love for teaching, wisdom to teach. Lord, let this grace, let this gift, in all its many facets, in all its many unique ways, just fall afresh on your children, your servants, your friends, Lord. Holy Spirit, come. Fall afresh on us, we pray. Spirit of God, come as on the day of Pentecost and inflame our hearts with a love for you, for the mission Jesus has sent us on. Holy Spirit, come. We thank you. We praise you. Lord, we entrust these prayers to you in a special way through your wonderful saints, through St. Saint John Bosco, through St. John Vianney, our blessed mother and all the great saints. We thank you, Lord. We praise you, Lord. And may the blessing of Almighty God descend upon you now, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and remain with you forever. Amen. Thank you so much, Father Mark. That was really, really wonderful. Very inspiring, uplifting. I would say challenging as well. I think, um, at least speaking for myself, um, that bar of sanctity is looking higher and higher. <laughs> um, yeah, work to be done. But um, you certainly seem to have found your own calling, I, I can say that. It's just beautiful to witness that. We're just so privileged to have you here today. I'm so thankful that you said yes to our invitation to come and speak to us. Um, so we do have, uh, I don't know whether you have any time for, to answer questions. Yeah, yeah, sure, we can, we can take a few questions if, uh, if uh, people want to, to do that. Um, are these questions for Father? Uh, Father, I was wondering if you could give some words of encouragement to parents who teach their own children, and what kind of message do you have for them? Yeah, I mean, I, I'm, I'm not an authority in that area, the, the whole um, approach to teaching your children. I mean, it's a tough one. I mean, what's being taught in our schools, and some not some of our schools are excellent. By the way. So I, I, I apologize for making generalizations. It's wrong of me to do that. But the fact is, is there's some stories of kids being sent to school, and it's not just, unfortunately, sometimes from the teachers, but also fellow students. Like, it's it's the mindset of the world that you know it is you know, it's weird. And if, if your child kind of starts opening up and buying into some of these new ideologies, especially in the area of their sexuality, that can do a lot of damage. And I think parents, they need to, you know, do some soul searching and just ask themselves, you know, how, I mean, St. Joseph, he fled to Egypt to protect his son, you know, and, and so, I mean, I can't speak in individual cases because every town or city has different situations, but uh, um, it's a tough one. I, I feel for parents, you know, that's, that's obviously a huge challenge. And when I speak to parents, they're very concerned about this, you know, so I, I don't know how to anything, but uh, I mean, you would probably have some very good answers to these questions. I hope you have some opportunities to interact with small groups and all of that because yeah that's a that's a tough one you know and those of you who are school teachers you know thank you so much for the efforts you make to you know to be faithful to, to the natural law and to common sense in the teaching of the catholic church i, I know there are some excellent school teachers who are fighting the battles it's not easy for them so yeah Any, any other questions?
Father? I see uh, some hands at the back. Maybe um, I'll try to repeat the question if I can, I can hear it. Yeah, maybe I'll. I just, I'm curious, I hear a voice, but raise your hand, I'll take all the way at the back. Hi, right, thank you for your question. So St. Philip, St. Philip Neri, and, and what, what were you asking about St. Philip Neri? Uh, just if you've seen his life, in a particular way he uh, connected to vocation teaching. Yeah, I mean, St. Philip Neri is, is, you know, one of these delightful saints, prophet of joy, um, I mean, he founded his own community, the, the Oratory. He cared for the young people in Rome, um, totally filled with the Holy Spirit. Um, I, I, I'm not sure like, if, how particularly, I mean, he's just inspiring in every way possible, but in particular for teaching, I, I guess. Yeah, I mean, I'm just, I'm just thinking, that joy and kindness and not pushing people down and lifting people up. So, yeah, he's definitely in the same vein as St. John Bosco. So stick with St. Philip Neri. He's a, he's a great, he's another one. He's one of, you know, there's these saints, they're, 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 I call them the beloved, the, the, among the most beloved, you know, St. Therese of Lisieux, um, St. John Bosco, St. Saint, uh, Philip Neri, St. Francis of Assisi, like St. Uh, Joan of Arc, and you know, some of these saints are just so lovable. I mean, they're all lovable, but some in a particular way. Thank you. Yes? Yeah. Father, good question. How do you serve? the truth in your environment with the people who are professing to be Catholics, but you're trying to navigate through the truth in the lie. Yeah. I'm seeing it in the church, I'm seeing it in schools, I'm seeing it everywhere. So yeah. I know what things you can offer in terms of providing us here is how much service because how much should we trust anyone? Yeah. Are there, would you mind just summarizing the questions? So, so that, yeah. yeah, for our viewers, but by the way, hi to our online viewers, thank you so much for being with us. Um, so the question is, how do you discern the truth in a world where there's sometimes so many conflicting messages, even within the church? I remember I asked my dad the same question when I was a teenager, because you know, at that time too, there was just you know some people who thought we should be doing this and doing that. The answer my dad gave is, is you, have, you have to find the saints in your time, you know. And at the time, for example, Saint Mother Teresa was just a shining light, and boy, she was a pretty staunch Catholic. Like she didn't get into any of the weird stuff, you know. She was, you know, kind of a traditional, faithful to the gospel, no nonsense, pious, devout. And and there were others, you know. And so I would say, and that's what that's what I do because I I have the same question, you know. And so, you know, for me, there there are people, and I just I, I I love these guys, you know. They seem to see clearly, and I, you know, for example, for me, I love um, Bishop Joseph Strickland, you know, um, you know, Bishop Cornelius Leone, um, Bishop Schneider, and, you know. There's a few people they seem to be kind of navigating the the, the treacherous waters with a wisdom, with a holiness, with a love, like kind of, and so, so I would say try to find the saints in our time, to discern the saints in our time, and kind of let them kind of guide you and kind of figure out, because yeah, you can, you can, you know, fall into extremes, and I, I and so, that's, that's my kind of personal way of trying to navigate. Yes. Once you find that call, joy, fire, can you give one tip of how to safeguard that? Well, if you don't mind, I'll give you two tips based on St. John Bosco. For him, he repeated this his whole life. I think his dying words were repeated, or something on it, or towards the end, he repeated two things. 
the Holy Eucharist and our Blessed Mother. So he was huge into, you know, a love for our Lord in the Holy Eucharist, Eucharistic adoration, receiving our Lord in the Holy Eucharist. And also he had a tremendous love for the Blessed Virgin Mary. He entrusted everything to the Blessed Mother, you know. So keep going to church, try to go to adoration if you can. Pray your rosary every day, you know, stay close to our Lord in the Holy Eucharist, to our Blessed Mother, and I'm pretty sure you'll be good. You know, I'm sure you'll be good. So, <laughs> you're welcome. Yes? Well, what insights have you gained from your ministry on YouTube? <laughs> okay, what, what insights have I gained from my ministry on YouTube? I mean, one thing is people are looking for a voice of, of faith, you know, of, of, of fire. And I think people are looking for a, a voice that is willing to, to speak into some of the current issues a bit, you know? Like, I try not to make my YouTube ministry be just kind of whatever, political or, or, you know, opinion stuff. But I think at one point you have to say something about this stuff, <laughs> you know. And so, and I, I it, it, it seems like I'm, I'm one of the few voices among the clergy, and I hope I'm doing this properly, you know. But one of the few voices among the clergy who's kind of willing to speak into some of these, you know, situations. Uh, but I think just a lot of people are just looking for, you know, just inspiration, and I. You know, I try to pray about everything I say and, you know, all of that. So, I mean, there's, it's, it's an intro. I mean, it, it's amazing. I get up in the morning. I do my holy hour. I turn my phone on. I can use my phone, you know. And I talk to my phone. And then I upload it and reach people all around the world. And it's free. Like, it's, it, it, anyone can do it. You know, some days I think to myself, like, is this for real? <laughs> simple and easy to reach people all around the world, you know, so, but again, let me tell you something, the forces of darkness, you know, the people who are in the culture of death, they're kind of bombarding the world with all of their nonsense, so they're, you know, we Catholics, we need to be writing the children's books and the novels and the TV shows and the movies and, and giving opinion on, you know, on, on, on the internet, you know, we need to be doing stuff, you know, because the at the end of our life, the Lord's going to ask us, what have you done with the gifts I've given you? <laughs> you know, and I don't think saying, well, I was so humble, I did nothing. That's not going to work. I don't think, I don't think, you know. And the thing is, the Lord chooses fools to do His work. God chose the foolish of the world to shame the wise, you know. Is that what the scripture says? God chose the foolish of the world to shame the wise. Uh, what was the other one? Anyways, so I'm mean, you're getting people one. <laughs> any, any other? Yes? I, I don't know. I don't know. I mean, the, the Catholic. So, the the question is, will the Catholic Church in Canada see to it that parents assume the role of catechizing their children rather than the schools? And is that is that right? Oh, oh, parishes. The parishes doing that. Okay, yeah, that, that's a very good question. I mean, I think you know, in, in Canada, there are so many different provinces with different systems and I think it would be more from a diocese to diocese question so I I, I don't know you know um, it's very important to catechize our, our, our people I, I think you know we need to we need we need to realize that we need to do this <laughs> you know like you can't wait for others to do it we need to do it so I don't know if that helps so. Any other questions? Yes? It's a statement, I guess. Some people feel that, well, it's on my heart, but I'm waiting for somebody else to do it. So a lot of people don't realize if it's on your heart, it's probably your call. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, that's, it's a basic principle. Eh? They say if you want to know what your calling is, one of the ways to discover it is ask yourself, what bugs you? You know, like what? You know, 10 people will come into a church, and one person will say, oh, this church isn't, you know, nice and clean and tidy like it could be. Another person says this church isn't decorated like it could be. Another person says this, the music isn't as good as it could be. Another person says, you know, there should be a social after with 
coffee and, and muffins. And, well, the thing that bugs you, that might be exactly what the Lord is saying, yeah, actually, I was going to get you to do that. <laughs> so, that's, that's a good point. Okay. Yes? Hi. Um, my question is about people who have fallen away from the church because they've lost faith in the church, yeah. in the institution of the church, yeah. because of, well, the many the issues that are out there right now today that are so prevalent. Yeah. Um, well, I know some people. Yeah. They've talked to me about their faith and that they feel lost and yeah. they've lost faith in the church. And, not in God, yeah. but in the church. Yeah. What do you do? How, how do you encourage them to, you know, come back to the sacraments? And yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it, it is a tough one. So the question is, what do you do with Catholics who've lost faith in the church? They haven't lost faith in God, but they're so <coughs> fed up with the nonsense in the church, whatever, that they're saying, I just don't want to have anything to do with the Catholic Church as an institution. And, um, yeah, I mean, I think obviously one answer is to, to be a good witness as a Catholic, to show them that, no, you know, like, there are Catholics who love the church, and they see the problems too, but they're persevering. Um, one of my go-to ways to kind of evangelize people is to give them a really good Catholic book, you know, if they're willing to, to, to read, because, you know, I, I just you know, find that if a person is willing to consider more than just what their narrow view is, they'll appreciate that the church is bigger than the issues of our time. But yeah, that's a, that's a, that's a tough one. Can you recommend a good book or two? Well, my go-to book, and again, it's just me personally, but I, I love the story of Our Lady of Cabello. It's apparitions of the Blessed Virgin Mary that have happened recently and are not only approved by the local bishop, but by the Vatican. It's a, it's a, it's a mind-blowing story related to the genocide. Our Blessed Mother came urging repeatedly for the people, the Hutus and the Tutsis, to reconcile because what they were doing would lead to, to ruin. Blood would run through the... the you know the, the, the country, and that's what happened. And, and it's you know it's 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 also just a it's a stunning story of the reality that God is real. <laughs> He's not hiding. And then you know the Eucharistic miracles of our time too. They're the recent ones again recognized, approved by the Church, thoroughly investigated scientifically, and medically, mind blowing. So stuff like that is like listen. You need to snap out of your issues, which again I mean they're, they're legit, but God is real. And he's alive, and he's trying to get our attention, and so that those are kind of my go-to is those two things. Are, but depending on what the person needs. What is the first book called? Okay. Our Lady of Kibbeho. It's written by Immaculate Ibigaza. Um, nice read. Again, I passed out so many copies of that book. You know, teenagers who was like, here, read this. You know, because it's also the story of you know children and in high school girls in a boarding school and their blessed mother starts to appear to them and they're kind of persecuted. It's a great story, you know. And again, it's approved by the church, you know, so and it, it, it's recent. People are still alive today who experience all this stuff, you know. So Can you spell it? Kibeho. K I B E H O. Kibeho. K I B E H O. Our Lady of Kibeho. Written by Immaculate E Bagnes. Um uh, <laughs> you know, if you go to my website, FR Hartboard, it's on my list of recommended books. So you, you'll find the details there. Yeah. Okay. I think we could probably just be talking all evening, but we don't want to tire you out too much. So I have a gift here. event for those who are registered in the, in the conference and for those of you who aren't, I wish you a great rest of your evening. Maybe we'll see you next year at the Waitiwa Institute um, hosted by Arlene and organized by Arlene Student Institute College. Thank you very much. God bless you all.